Our protagonist plays a video game where he don't live in the past. So he click in panic, and in this game, he have to collect materials by defeating some very strong player monsters. Then we see that they reach the end of the game where they just need to get one more item to complete their collection. But if they die there, they will be sent back to the beginning of the game. After some time, we see that they managed to defeat that last monster, but it was clearly not easy. At least now they can hope to get a good job. Then, a notification window pops up, telling them that the item they obtained is a five-star dragon scale, which is one of the rarest and hardest to collect. It is said that those who possess it will receive divine protection. They are so excited that they start screaming at the top of their lungs. Suddenly, we see our protagonist appearing in the middle of the sky, and they are very surprised because they don't know where they are or what is happening. The only thing they know for sure is that they are floating in the air. Our protagonist then sits, if we can call it sitting, and he tries to calm down and think about what just happened to him. The last thing he remembers is being at home playing the Mon Mon Hunters game and then getting that super rare item. But after that, it's a bit blank for him. Suddenly, an unknown voice tells him that after he got that item, he fell down the stairs because he was too excited. Our protagonist thought that he stumbled, but when he turned around, there was someone standing there waving at him. The friendly stranger smiled and went on vacation. So we have stairs today. Although he didn't quite understand what was happening, he asked the person if they were really dead. Then he asked who they were, and he told him that the best way he could describe himself so he could understand was if they said he was a god. He was staring at him petrified parents and added that he wasn't actually the angels that people imagined in his world. But to them, the way they described himself only confirmed that he was really dead and that all of this wasn't a joke to him. He told him again that that's what happened, but he seemed unwilling to accept it. And his reason was that he couldn't gather all the materials he wanted to collect. He said this with enthusiasm, and the angelic god didn't change the pleasant expression. But he was curious about his caring nature of collecting things. So he asked him about it. And that's where he can find out that our protagonist fell in love with collecting random old items from interesting about the stone stories, or anything else that would catch his attention and grow up. It didn't really change his hobby, because he still continues to do it wherever he goes. Even in his favorite game, he usually ignores the storyline and only focuses on collecting materials, sometimes spending hours just to gather the best items he can find for him. All these seemingly random items have their own story. To collect them, he must understand how they are gathered and what they are used for. Imagining this in his mind will enhance any game he plays and make it much more immersive for him. When the angelic god hears how dedicated he is to collecting these items, he offers him a proposition. If he truly loves it, he can be reincarnated into a world where he can collect whatever and however much he wants. At first he can't believe what he's hearing, but he asks if it's real. The god assures him that this is the real reason why he brought him to this place to transport him to another world. When he hears this, he is truly shocked. He stares at the god in disbelief, but the god tells our protagonist that the world needs his regularly, and it is the duty of the god is to add mana. He adds that sometimes, when he pours mana himself, it creates chaos because it is difficult to maintain balance. That's why he needs him. The god then further explains that by using her body as a medium, he will be able to spread mana more efficiently in our protagonist's world. Thinking to himself that he doesn't want to be treated like a tool, he reads his thoughts and reassures him that he has nothing to worry about because he won't be harmed in the process. He then asks him why he chose him out of everyone else, and he simply smiles kindly and tells him that it's because of his great passion to complete his collection. He adds that when he is so focused on collecting different items, it connects to his soul and it is there even after he dies. Our protagonist feels very awkward because he knows his obsession is this close and he somewhat apologizes because he has to see it all, but he's okay with it, and he even says that in his world there are so many wonderful things that he likes. He is really interested in what he says because he thinks that the man in the world can only exist in his dreams. And then when he sees it like this, he asks him if he will accept his offer and adds that it won't be bad. A deal for him 
and we can see that our protagonist is thinking hard about this. But even though he has doubts about all this, he really wants to extend his life, which he thinks is too short with his death. So he now decides that he will try it and really become a material collector. So he firmly tells the god. The god that he understands everything and then asks him to send him to another world. The god politely smiles and thanks him and calls him a collector. And in an instant, our protagonist finds himself sitting somewhere in a realm covered by the shade of trees and beside a flowing river. That's when he gets his second surprise, where at first he thought it was a dream. But soon he realized that the place where he was surrounded looked strange. And he knew that it was another world that the god told him about. He started to cough, so he decided to go to the river and drink water to calm himself down a bit. But when he saw his reflection in the flow, he realized that he looked much younger than in his previous life, and he thought that the angelic god was only paying attention to him and thinking that it would be a little difficult for him with an older body in this new world, especially with his slightly bluish eyes, which he liked. Our protagonist also understood the importance of having a source of drinking water nearby because he knew how valuable it was, especially in this new world. He was very grateful to the angelic god for providing it for him, because it made everything easier. And at this point, it happened. He realized that he was actually in a completely different world, and we could see the optimistic spirit in his eyes about it, because he was ready to start a new life by collecting items in the other world and doing his best. Even though he was excited about his new adventure, the reality of the situation hit him because he didn't even know where to start in this new world, like where he should go. Before continuing his journey, our protagonist knew that he had to bring water with him in case he got stranded somewhere, and then he realized that he was drinking this water without knowing that it was the first drinkable source. He only assumed twice because it looked very clean, but that wasn't the only way for him to know this. He started contemplating boiling the water somehow before bringing it himself, but then when he approached the water a little closer, a notification window appeared that told him all the information about the stream, which surprised him a little because he wasn't used to things popping up randomly like that. But the information contained in it is very useful and convenient, and it is said that this is actually for my mineral-rich river water that can be drunk and flows to the village. At first, he didn't know why he could see this window, but then he remembered that the angelic god told him that she couldn't let him wander in her world without giving him the skills to navigate the foreign world. So he decided to give him any skills he wanted, and before he could decide where to ask the god about the place he was going to, the angelic god told him that it was not much different from the world he had in the game he played before he died, where there were magic monsters, and they were also scary monsters. The god also added that there were many magical items, and this description reminded our protagonist of the fantasy world of swords and magic that he loved so much. It sounded perfect to him if it weren't for the monsters he mentioned, because he didn't have much confidence in himself. He was just an ordinary employee and doubted his ability to fight any of those monsters, because he had never really gone to the gym and he didn't expect that he would be able to run faster than them due to his poor stamina. So there is only one solution for him if he's going to live in this new world, and that is the request he asked of the angelic god. Our protagonist wants her to give him enough power so that he can carry out his collection business in a joyful way where he doesn't have to worry about anything other than collecting his materials. In this new world, inside his head, a protagonist is thinking about how this will work, where he can't finish the game instantly but more like if he can sense danger before it actually happens or something similar. And at that moment, the god gives him typical smile to our protagonist and tells him that he accepts his request and will make him a collector who doesn't need to worry about anything in this world. He is quite happy because his request was granted when he told her that he only needs something small that won't be deadly when he goes to collect it. But he is actually aware that even though this request sounds simple, it is quite serious. So now he assumes that being able to easily like this information is the actual ability he gave him, but he still wonders why he didn't explain what his ability is. But he can't worry about it for now because he has that information in front of him. So he decides to trust her and takes a sip of the water, and he can't believe how delicious it is. 
The water is actually tastier than any water he has ever tried, and it feels like he's drinking pure water for the first time in his life. Our protagonist at that time decides to take some of the water for the road, but first he has to find something where he can put the water. And then he got the idea to check the bag given to him by the god. He don't know what happened to himself. The bag given to him by the angelic god surprised him because it was very deep. But not only that, the bag was already full of different items, and it really exceeded his expectations because he was just looking for a tube that he could fill with water. And when he took everything out to get a better idea of what he was actually doing, we could see some wooden chest, water skin, jars, pickaxe, iron stubble you pard, beginner's spellbook, the Instasian manual from God, knife, rations, gloves, five silver coins, rope, and net. The first thing that came to his mind was how he could carry all those items because they were too heavy, and he didn't even feel the weight as he walked around. And before anything else, our protagonist decided to read the instruction manual to find out what it was about. And inside, he found some information about the magic bag, where he learned why he could carry so many items. It was because the bag could compress space, making the items more portable. Another great thing about the bag that we learned from this instruction manual is that time inside it freezes, which means he doesn't have to worry about preserving food. And the only limitation is that he can't put any living creatures inside. The instruction manual also describes the ability given to him by the angelic god, where he can extract mana from his body to basically detect nearby materials. And with higher skill, he can increase the detection range. Another skill he has is appraisal. Just like everyone else who got isekai'd with the adventure skill, he also got it. With this skill, by observing an item, he can obtain information about it, and the more he focuses on the item, the more details he will get from it, and it's very convenient. So now our protagonist knows that it's because of this appraisal skill that he can get information about the water flow, and because he doesn't really know how his survey skill works, he wants to try it out. So he reads the manual again, but he struggles to emit mana waves because he can't sense it. He tries to visualize it in a different way, but one thing that helps him the most is when he imagines ripples of wind spreading around him, and he closes his eyes. And at that moment, his senses suddenly increase when he can feel the wind around him, the water in the river, and even the fish in the river. And the more he concentrates, he can even hear small sounds moving until he can follow a droplet of water falling. He thinks it's truly amazing, and then when he fully immerses himself in it, he opens his eyes and shouts, Survey! And suddenly things around him start to shimmer, at first dimly, and then the more he looks, the brighter the light becomes. Shining from those dots is almost like different objects wrapped in bubbles of light that only he can see when he sees them. One shining object, another object will catch his attention, and there are so many objects everywhere, and our protagonist then realizes that all these sparkling objects are basically materials. He looks around again until he sees something that catches his attention, and he starts running towards it to get closer. And not long after, he arrives there, and it is a kind of flower that he thinks looks very beautiful. But he wonders if the flower is useful for him, so he then decides to use his judgment ability to read information about the flower. And when he judges the flower, it is said that it is called a zami potion, and prepared differently. The flower can be used for healing or appetite-stimulating tea. But when picked, it must be pulled from its roots. Our protagonist is truly impressed with all the information provided by his ability, including the correct way to gather it. Our protagonist is now shining with happiness as he thinks to himself how in this amazing new world he can collect things by taking them with his own hands, and it feels so enjoyable, and he hugs the flower. After safely storing it, he said that the Azami herbs would be the first ingredient for his collection. Then he realized what Angel meant when she said that her request was not as low as he thought, even though the abilities he asked for were not flashy magic. They were very powerful and made his collection work much smoother, almost like magic. He was a scammer, and while he was making his new potion backup, he said that he shouldn't get too carried away because he might get unnecessary trouble. So he should be careful now. The next thing our protagonist had to do was to follow this flow as it should lead him to the village, according to the information he read, but when he started. 
He turned around and excitedly said that before going to the village. He should first check everything he found with his abilities, and he ran to search for materials in the surrounding area. Now some time has passed, and we see that our protagonist has become very tired from all the acting he has done because the magic he has is like an endless hole, and he doesn't even realize that he is just constantly taking items. But at least now his detection ability has become stronger to the point where my friend starts having epilepsy because of all the flashing lights he can see. So he decides to try narrowing down his search, and what surprises him is that he is able to do that just by focusing on one thing in his mind, and then he thinks because he is close to them. It would be a shame to leave them just like that. But at that moment, he noticed a few things. The lights were moving and this caught his attention because they usually don't move like that, so he became very curious to find out what it was. He started walking towards the moving lights when our protagonist got closer to the source of the light. He peeked around the grass and what surprised him even more, he found out that it was a monster and they looked really cruel, like something you shouldn't disturb. So he did his best not to stand out and hid himself, closing his mouth tightly. We could see the panic in his eyes. Then he used his judgment and told himself that these monsters are called Wagners and they are ranked as quite dangerous. But the information also told him that because they have a foul smell in their hearing, they don't pose much danger to anyone as they can't directly see. Our protagonist tightly closed his mouth and then ran away from these wild animals. After he made a certain distance, we could see that our little boy was very scared and running so fast that he wet his pants. He could hardly breathe, but he was somewhat satisfied because his ability could capture monsters like that. And it would also make it easier for him to avoid them even if he couldn't directly use his fighting ability. He felt very grateful to the angelic god for giving him an ability that has so many different uses. But he also knew that if it was a dark day, he would encounter some problems. So he decided that he had to go to the village as quickly as he could. And that's when he noticed the bright golden light and wondered if it was a material he could collect. It crossed his mind that he had just said to himself, that he would have problems if the night came down and he wasn't in the village. But he thought to himself again that he would just do this, and that's how it all began, the beginning of all addictions. And we can see our protagonist running towards the source of light and thinking to himself that until then, he had only seen blue and purple lights. So he wondered if there was a difference between them, and if the different colors indicated something about these materials. He had never played a video game in his life, and he didn't know that rarity items had colors and that gold might be a legendary rarity. But let's see. If he will know when he gets to the place where the object is, he sees a pretty shiny item on the ground and he picks it up. The protagonist is really impressed with it, but he doesn't know what it is, so he decides to use his appraisal skills, and when he appraises it, a notification window pops up saying that it is a red dragon scale, also known as the king's scale. Furthermore, the window informs him that because of its toughness, the sky is even further away. This material will be used to create durable armor and powerful weapons. Additionally, it is also a powerful catalyst for magic and alchemy, which is why our protagonist is so eager to find it. They were thrilled when they discovered a dragon scale that said this type of item would be the highest level in the game they usually play. They felt incredibly lucky to have found it on their first day in this new world. However, they soon realized that rare items like this wouldn't just be left out in the open. They always come with difficult obstacles. It was at this moment that they started to feel a bit scared. They imagined that a dragon who had shed the scale might be watching them and waiting to devour them alive. So they decided to use another one of their abilities to scan the area for any dragons. They did this cleverly by focusing their surveying ability on a dragon scale level. Luckily for them, they didn't detect any nearby dragons. This was a huge relief for our protagonist because they knew they were at least safe for now. Now, he was thinking that finding such a rare item on the first day is like a one-time login reward. And now they also know that the different colors he present indicate a difference of 30 levels, of course. But they're still not completely sure so they decide to confirm it once they reach the village. And that is smart. He told him that every time he have a suspicion, he should confirm it with someone who has more knowledge about it. Besides, 
Our protagonist couldn't hide his excitement when he found the red dragon scale, so he slipped and fell down the stairs again. It had already happened at the beginning of the story, when he decided to finish his gathering session there and go to the village. Since he didn't know about this village, he was sometimes excited to explore it. Then we see our protagonist arriving at the Fermi village, and he is very excited about it. He then sees someone standing there at the gate who looks like a guard, and he wonders who this person will be. So he approaches the stern-looking man and nervously asks him if this is the village. The man stares at him sharply and confirms that it is indeed the village. But then he asks our protagonist who he is and what he is doing there. Our protagonist clears his throat and politely introduces himself, and this is where we find out that our protagonist's name is Sozai Shu. He also told the guard that he's a traveler collecting materials along the way, and he needs a place to stay. So he wondered if he could stay in the Fermi village. The guard then smiled and told our protagonist that it's reassuring to know he's an adventurer specializing in collections. The guard also mentioned that Shou might be stronger than he looks because he was able to survive those dangers in the forest full of monsters. But we could see our protagonist feeling awkward, thinking to himself that he couldn't reveal the truth about his ability to avoid all the monsters introduced by the service. Roland added that he's a guard in the Fermi village and apologized for scaring Shu like he did. He also mentioned that they don't get many visitors, but our protagonist is welcome to stay in their village. They shook hands and Roland then commented on how strange our protagonist's name is when he read it together as Sozai Shu. Shu confidently told him that it was read separately and that his real name was just Shu. When Roland heard this, his expression changed and he looked worried. Occasionally he would say that if Shu had a last name, it meant she was a noble or something that our protagonist quickly realized. He thought that introducing himself as a noble was a bad idea because he wasn't one. One of the things he had just told Roland was some nonsense he made up about how Sho had just described his material. Hearing this, Roland rolled his eyes and laughed. Then he told Shu that he was a bit strange, but didn't want to dwell on the topic because it was awkward for both of them. Roland told Shu that because he thought he was tired from his journey to their village, he wouldn't keep him for too long. He then directed him towards the village's building where he could stay overnight. Shu was very grateful, and we could see his excitement renewed at that moment. He apologized to Roland and went to the town. There he saw nice buildings and some beautiful ones. The welcoming people happily waved at him, which relieved his worries and assured him that the village was actually very nice. He then arrived at the place Roland directed him to, which was inside. He recognized it from the sign standing outside, and somehow he could read the sign above it. Even though he had never seen those letters before, and he realized that it might also be because of the power given to him by the angelic god. He was very happy with it, because the power seemed to encompass everything he really needed so it was really convenient and reliable for him not to enter the place and sneak in to greet him, but no one answered, and when he thought that there was no one there. Someone welcomed him, and when he turned around to see who that person was, there was a little girl with braids, and she enthusiastically asked our protagonist if he was a guest, and surely told her that she was the one who now made her stare at her in amazement, because we could see her eyes sparkling, and when she asked who he was, she just started running and calling because her mother said that they were now guessing a woman with a pleasant appearance, if he dare say so, then go down the stairs. And when she saw Shu, she realized that she had never seen him before, which might mean that he was a traveler, and she confirmed this and told him that he had arrived in the village recently. Our protagonist then introduced himself, and the woman also introduced herself where we learned that her name was Anna and she was the landlady in that place, and then she introduced her daughter Nico to him, and Nico just wanted to make sure that you heard her name correctly. So, he repeated the little girl name once again, and couldn't ask the woman if they had a room available for him for the night, even though he didn't have a reservation. She told him that they definitely would, as they were used to having guests and travelers since they were located in a rural area. Our protagonist then asked her because he wasn't sure if he would have enough money, how much a night here would cost. He knew he had some resources he could use in this situation, but he was still a little worried. 
Anna told him that the knight would give him four silver coins, and if he paid an extra coin, he would get breakfast and dinner and become a wise philosopher. He said, I like breakfast in bed, but what I like even more is breakfast and a head. When he heard this, he was initially very happy, but then he realized that he didn't know how the monetary system worked here, so he felt a little nervous. Embarrassed because he didn't know this, he told the woman that he came from a faraway country and that he didn't really understand their currency at all, and he just wanted to know what he would get because he didn't know about money here. But then she explained how their monetary system worked, and basically there were five types of coins with copper being the lowest value and platinum being the most expensive with gold coins next to it. Later, Anna told Sho that each coin was worth ten coins of a lower level, adding that if he had silver coins, those silver coins would be worth ten bronze coins. To get a better understanding of this, he then told Anna that he would stay for ten nights, including all meals. Anna seemed happy when he said that they hadn't had guests in a while and that they would make sure to make him feel welcome in their place. He then told her daughter Nico to show our protagonist the room where he would stay, and Nico eagerly agreed to give him a tour of the room as he walked up the stairs and looked around inside. He told Nico how he thought their room was quite luxurious, and she told him that they were actually very proud of it and their food, and wanted to try their luck further. He then asked Nico if they offered a bath for him as it would be a treat, but he actually couldn't believe that he even asked this, saying that he couldn't expect them to go through all that trouble, and it was even strange to ask. He was really disappointed to hear this because he really wanted to have a bath for himself, and then Nico told him that they could bring him a bucket of hot water and some towels for the price of one bronze coin if he really wanted it. They arrived at the room where our protagonist was staying, and Nico proudly showed it to him, adding that it was the biggest room they had. When he saw it, our protagonist was impressed and said that it felt too good to be alone there. Nicole Nico also asked if he needed help with anything else, and he mentioned that he had some materials he found in the forest and was interested in selling them. So he asked if he knew a place where he could sell them, and Nico told him about a man named Podan who might buy his items. Nico thought about it and then told Shu that Podan might still be working, but if he wanted, he could take him to his place. Our protagonist was thrilled to hear this and told him to take him there. Nico told him that he would wait for him on the ground floor, and when he felt properly rested, he would be waiting there so he could just call him. Our protagonist felt very comfortable with this arrangement, but then when he agreed, he caught a glimpse of the little girl behind the door and asked if something was wrong. Nico eagerly told him not to forget to call her, and we could see that Sho blushed because he found it very sweet. He laughed and told her that he would make sure to call her as soon as he was ready, and as she left, he relaxed on the bed, thinking about how happy he was to come to this Fermi village and to meet such kind-hearted people. It felt like a blessing to him. Now we see the protagonist, Shu, as he spreads all the materials he took from his exploration of the forest along the way to the village, contemplating which ones to sell and which ones to keep. He came to the conclusion that he should sell all kinds of materials that could be used to make equipment, while he could keep all the medicinal plants with him as they would be useful. And when he saw the shining red dragon scale, he thought it looked very expensive. And because it looked so beautiful to him, he couldn't easily let it go, so he decided to keep it for now, treating it as his pet. Now that he finished sorting all the items and materials, he went down into the basement and called for Nico. But seeing that she was busy mopping the floor, he asked her if she had time to accompany him to the place where he could tell her about his belongings. However, Nico's mother, Anna, stopped by and informed our protagonist that she was definitely busy with work around the inn. Little Nico switched to full puppy mode with her big eyes and begged her mother to let her go with Shu. He said that he made an important promise and that he would feel bad if he broke it with their guest because there was no way out of it since their guest was listening to this. And he reluctantly agreed and told Nico that he was free to accompany our protagonist. And a few moments later on the way to the inn, politely asked him if he was just trying to avoid his duties in the end and he confidently answered by taking him wherever he wanted to go. He had already helped at the inn because he opposed it, and our protagonist found it funny how he responded 
and couldn't deny that he was right when they walked. Nico noticed Shu's big bag and then told her that he was interested in what kind of material she had, and she just told him that she didn't think she had anything special to sell, but she would still try to be on guard, and after some time walking, they finally arrived at Podan's. That place and Nico excitedly told him that everyone would come there to buy equipment because the place was very popular with the locals, and when they got there, Nico greeted him but there was no one inside, and our protagonist Shu looked into the shop. And then he really surprised to see all the different items and materials. It seemed like the place had everything, and it was really packed with a lot of materials that she actually knew, but also with things she had never seen before and she didn't know about them. It's really someone's dream place like a zoo, and all kinds of ideas started flowing in his mind as he searched with his eyes through all those items, or rather she was just looking for an excuse to get more stuff. When he saw his cooking equipment, he thought to himself that because the god didn't give him anything, he should bring it here. When he looked around, he found a very interesting object that he had never seen before. So he used his judgment to examine what the object was. And when he analyzed it, he received a notification window that told him it was a magical stove that worked with mana stones, which he thought was pretty cool. When he realized how convenient and great this item was, he started imagining himself in all kinds of scenarios where he would use it because it was portable and he could make delicious food with it. But when he decided to buy it, he saw the price and it was one platinum coin, which meant ten gold coins, which he definitely didn't have. So he became very disappointed, and even if he sold all his belongings, he still thought there was no possibility that he would have enough. And when he suffered because of this, a man appeared and apologized to them for the wait, and then told him that he was just browsing some materials, and he was not used to customers coming at this time. We soon realized that the store owner might be familiar with Nico and Anna when he asked Nico if he had any business with Anna. But Nico told him that this time he really gave him a customer who wanted to sell some materials, and we could see that Podan became excited with these words that he heard a traveler coming to their village. They then introduced themselves, and Podan told Sho that since then they haven't had many visitors in their village. It's really nice to have someone from time to time who will bring them some goods from outside. And as soon as our protagonist put his bag on the table so he could take out his belongings, Podan realized that the bag was a magic bag. He was surprised because the shop owner could know this just by looking at it. But Podan explained that the magic bag actually has a history where a very skilled space wizard used to make it. But even for them, the magic bag is still a magic bag. It's difficult, so now that kind of technology is lost, and now it's a rare item. So it's a special opportunity to see someone strong being surprised by this. And then he eagerly asked Shu where she got it from, and our protagonist knew that he would sound silly if he told her that he got it from the god, and to get out of this difficult situation, he started pretending to cry telling Sho that he got the magic bag from someone who is no longer with him. And when Podan realized what might have happened, he apologized for being demanding by asking such insensitive questions, and then told him that he wanted to see the materials through Podan's head, quickly observing and evaluating the value of various materials he had, where he told him that everything is useful, and then offered him seven copper coins and one silver coin for those items, and he also added three more silver coins for Wagner's fangs. However, this has confirmed our protagonist's idea that the color of his surveillance ability truly represents different values and a fairly neat rarity. And then he presents a white snakeskin, and we can see that Podon really likes this item and says that its shape is still visible because it has just melted. He now feels confident in his ability because this item shines in orange color, so he knows that it will be slightly more valuable than others, and he aims to get around eight silver coins. But what surprises him is that Podan offers four gold coins instead. And not only is it true that he is surprised, even little Nico is astonished because Podan misread their surprise and thought that our protagonist was disappointed with how little he offered. Then he said that it is true that the white snake skin is very difficult to obtain. That's why it is so valuable. And then he continues to increase his offer, even writing six gold coins, which our protagonist is crazy about. Nico feels annoyed by this, and he is really confused. 
So he angrily asks why the snakeskin is expensive because he sees many snakeskins lying randomly around the village. And Podan then explains that it is because this special snakeskin emits a nice glow that makes it very popular, especially among the nobles who would pay a large amount of money to get it, where women would then use it for their bags to show their status and basically to flaunt it. Shu no when Padan also mentioned that he might be able to get a much better price if he went to the capital city, but our protagonist insisted that he wanted to sell it to Padan, and Padan was very grateful for our protagonist's kindness. He also saw full moon grass and offered three gold coins for it. He was confused by this because she thought it was just ordinary old grass, but she shot and explained that this grass is capable of absorbing moonlight and can also be used for healing and other things that make it valuable. He was really impressed with how knowledgeable our protagonist was, not knowing that our protagonist was just misusing the judgment. We also know that Sho used this opportunity to learn more about this world market when she found Pota, and was trustworthy enough to tell her the actual price of the goods, and now she receives payment of ten gold coins, and a very large interest from Nico. so she asks him if he makes a living just by collecting materials. And Podan tells her that it's only possible because he is very talented, again, not knowing that he has a cheat on his side. Basically, he tells Nico that it's time for them to return to the inn, but the boat team stops, and now with a little nervousness, asks our protagonist if he can help him. Seeing his skill, Pudan have a request to him to find more moon grass. He confident in Sho's skills and not wanting to let this opportunity pass, so he makes this request. And both Sho and Nico are surprised by this because it came out of nowhere. Shu, our protagonist and the little girl Nico, have different reactions to what the shopkeeper did. He said, and he was a little anxious and worried while Nico was truly amazed by his statement. He said he wanted to find a moon grass for her, and Nico's eyes sparkled with excitement. He immediately knew that it must be a gift for the old man. His wife and he nervously laughed and said that his birthday was coming soon. Little Nico held his hand, and he was already lost in his thoughts about the moon grass, which was just a name for a specific flower that only bloomed in the moon knight's garden. It seemed fitting under the moonlight, just like sunflowers sitting under the sunlight. He know, when he say it like this, it doesn't sound magical because you have sunflowers. Sunflowers are quite normal. But when you say moon grass, it sounds magical. But if you compare the two, it looks more realistic and not so magical. And because the flower is rare, it is considered a very precious gift given only to the person we truly love and cherish. Nico imagined that receiving such a gift was equivalent to someone saying they wanted to spend their life with you. But when Nico realized that moon grass only bloomed under the light of the full moon, it meant that the grass was very difficult to find, and even more difficult to find the flower. While it was blooming, he thought hard and listened carefully. He raised his head and thought about helping, but in the end, gathering such a flower was a stroke of luck. He had a few ideas that could potentially increase his chances of finding what the old man was looking for, but he didn't mention anything, because he didn't want to raise the old man's hopes and disappoint him afterwards. As he was immersed in his thoughts, the old shopkeeper sneaked up behind him and whispered his name, startling him because he was completely focused on that special flower. The old man wanted his wife to smile, so he looked at the shoe's reaction and held something in his hand, socially observing the magical stove he was selling. He brought it over to show the shoe how it worked, and he was genuinely surprised by its movements. The old man said it wasn't a problem and happily showed him how the stove worked. The magical stove had a glass container that needed to be filled with mana stones, which then served as fuel. Sho took one of the small stones and was amazed at how beautiful they were. The stones fascinated him so much that he tried to use his judgment to see if he could gather additional information. He discovered that those stones were basically crystal formations of monster blood infused with mana, and they were used to create and enhance equipment and weapons. The purer the mana stone, the higher its value, and the more mana it stored. He pondered on another strategy and thought that if he used his service skills on those stones, he could potentially find all the nearby monsters. As he wondered whether it would work or not, the old man called him, turned around, and the old man cranked the handle on the stove, making a ratcheting sound and the fire lit up. 
Both Shu and little Nico were amazed at how easily the old man ignited the fire. Sho realized that controlling the power of fire was also easy, and thought that he could become a Michelin star chef if he had a stove like that. The old man saw his opportunity and took it. He saw the true love of the magic stone moving, and he tried to sell him various items like special dried meat, various spices, and even bread. He was convinced that having a barbecue on the stove using those ingredients would be a magical thing and he believed every word the old man said that he would magically be able to bring all of it with him whenever he wanted, and he could get freshly prepared food any time. Although he was truly tempted, he couldn't give in because he didn't have the money and the stove was too expensive. The old man wanted to sell it to him, and he told Shu that if she gave him the full moon grass, he would lower the price of the stove to five gold coins. Shu looked very happy with that price, and she promised the old man to buy him the flower as soon as they agreed. The old man shattered his determination with one additional spicy piece of information. Podan wife's birthday was approaching, and it was faster than anyone expected because Shu only had four days to find and gather the flowers, which made her feel desperate. Nico tried to console her by saying how he believed she could do it because he also collected rare items in the past, and he truly felt sad because he didn't know where to look or where to start his search. Nico told her that his father spent time in the forest since he was a child, and that he might help her or give her some advice after hearing that the shoes would grow a little stronger, and she eagerly stood up and asked Nico to take her to meet his father when they came to his house. His father greeted both of them, and Shu was somewhat surprised to see a familiar face. Seeing Roland, the guard, Shu initially thought he was just a regular visitor. But it turned out he was Nico's father when the little girl ran into his arms and called him dad. Roland immediately started joking with Shu and called her a scoundrel for taking his little girl on a date without his permission. I don't know what to think about jokes like this, bro. Because you know she's underage. And he think that in this new world maybe it's okay when he's joking with Shu, his wife called him from the kitchen, and politely asked if he could help her if he didn't have anything else to do when Roland would return to the kitchen. He turned around to grab his shoes and signaled to her that his wife's food was delicious and he would get something great soon. He would stay there with Nico, who realized that he didn't need to introduce the shoes to his father, and he awkwardly laughed and added that he would ask Roland about the moon grass another time they had dinner, and it was nighttime, and after he went straight to sleep, they gave him a room, and when he lay on the big bed, he was glad that he had survived the first one. One day in another world, even though he knew his body was tired, he didn't feel like sleeping anytime soon. So remember that he had a book in his bag and he stood up from the bed to see what the book was about. And once he found it, he saw that the book was a beginner's spell book. So he checked it out a bit and flipped through some pages while thinking that magic could be useful in his search for moon grass. The book had one statement that caught his attention and it seemed like a pretty important concept in terms of magic. The statement said that magic depends on balanced imagination and will, and the way it works is the magician infuses their imagination with mana, and the more they desire their imagination to become real, the stronger their magic becomes. His mantra was to see all the different elements of magic, and he could recognize them from the game he used to play in his previous life, when he made judgments and service work, he decided to try some other mantras he found in the book. The first one he found wasn't quite suitable for his current situation because he was inside a house full of wooden furniture. And the spell is a fireball, so a tool to escape with something safer and something that can be useful even inside. And he stumbled upon a lamp ball spell. He tried it and a strong beam of light came from his room and everyone in the house was shocked and scared at the same time by the flash. A light mantra that just gives the light. It feels so comfortable to throw it in those dark caves. Of the falling shoe and holds his eyes because the flash almost blinds him. The other residents called him, but he said he was fine because he was lying on the floor and couldn't realize what was happening with his magic. Shu fell asleep in his bed, and when he woke up, he saw the god. And then the god smiled at him, and after seeing God, he lost his mind. The god greeted him and said good morning and good night, depending on how he saw it. The god congratulated him because it was the first time he reincarnated, and he did well. But hearing all that, Sho's eyes started to water, and he thought that if he saw the god, he would die again. 
He considered his reincarnated life as some kind of game, but the god didn't mind. He assured him that he was still very much alive, and added that she was worried about him because he was the one who reincarnated and carried the burden of a new life on his shoulders. That's why she visited him, to see if he was okay. He felt like a huge rock had fallen off him. His chest was heavy, and he couldn't stop thinking about the god and her loving and kind nature. The god knew she had arrived in the village and he wanted to know how her first day was, and from the look on her face, he liked every second of it. He started telling her everything, down to the smallest detail, and the god felt a little intimidated by his story. God didn't need to know every little thing that had happened. She just wanted to hear how he felt about his first day. But still, the god listened to his whole story with a friendly smile on the face, and he was happy. He had fun because he was the one who decided to reincarnate. The god then asked Shu if there was something he didn't quite understand, or if he needed help with anything, and he was there to help him and give him the right guidance and advice. Sho had some questions about what happened last night. He explained how he flipped through the spell book given to him by the god, and when he tried one of the beginner spells, it ended up being too powerful, and he wanted to know why that happened. The god wasn't surprised by that, and she explained to him that even the most basic spells can become powerful because it all depends on the user's mana pool, and she didn't have it. He was not sure why he was so surprised because he asked for that kind of power from the beginning. Sho doesn't remember doing it, but the god reminded him that he said he wanted to become so strong that he could easily face monsters, so he could have more time to gather materials without constantly being on guard. It seems there was some misunderstanding when Sho said that, regardless of what he thought, he would choose materials in the wild that were not infested with monsters. The god smiled at him and said that everything was going well because she didn't have to worry about his safety. The god knew that he was fighting very strong monsters, even dragons, to search for and collect certain materials. But of course she answered that it was just a video game, and going through all of that in real life was very different. The god explained that she used it to send a large amount of mana to the world, so he had to be strong too. He couldn't understand why he complained about his existence being strong from the beginning. The god explained that if he managed to get used to his power, he could easily control the output of his spells, and she promised that she would try harder because their time together would soon end. The god wished him luck and told him to enjoy his reincarnated life. He thanked her and as soon as he woke up in his bed at Roland's house. He dressed up and went downstairs to greet Roland's wife, Anna. He was worried about her because she didn't come down for dinner last night, and there was also a bright flash of light coming from her room. Shu said everything was fine, and he was very tired, so he fell asleep as soon as he laid his head on the bed. He acted clueless about what happened last night. As Anna explained what happened, his stomach growled, and Anna invited him to have breakfast. He said he needed to eat a lot to make up for not eating last night. She prepared delicious food for him, and he was finally happy to have something to eat. He thanked her and commented on the food, but she said there was no need to praise her because everything on the table was part of the local cuisine. He turned his face towards the food and clasped his hands as if to express his gratitude, and he started eating like a madman, devouring everything with great satisfaction. He even asked Anna a few seconds later if the zoo was their first guest. Anna was happy to hear that and he continued eating until his stomach was completely full and he needed to rest after he finished. Meanwhile, Roland returned and Anna welcomed him at Shu's reception desk. She registered him and explained that he had just been doing his usual patrol outside the gate. Then, he immediately remembered what had happened last night and wondered if Shu was okay. He reassured him that there was no need to worry and took the opportunity to ask Roland about the moonflower. He explained that the old man, Mr. Podan, from the shop, wanted the flower for his wife, and since little Nico was with him, he thought Roland might have more information. Roland said that the last time he saw the flower was a long time ago, and he didn't remember anything specific. He only knew that he saw the flower in the forest, and it was bathing in the sunlight. He was a bit confused because Nico had mentioned that the flower needed moonlight to bloom, and it seemed like he had an idea. Sho thanked Roland for his advice. 
He stood up and smiled, even though he wasn't 100% sure he understood everything. He couldn't waste his time and set off to find it. Sho left the house and turned around, realizing that he had to go south to reach the forest where Roland had seen the full moon grass for a long time. Then he walked south, and as he walked, he decided to use that time to train his magic because he didn't have anything better to do. He could smell the grass, the wind blowing in the air, and how much he loved VR. Nothing could compare to it. Actually, he decided to try fire magic now because he couldn't try it at home, and more importantly, it might be very useful if he needed to set up a camp. He took a deep breath, trying to relax his body and mind, and released his fire magic once again. It was so powerful that it almost caused a serious forest fire. He quickly extinguished the fire by bringing his hands together, and as the fire spread, he used water magic to put it out. Finally, he was soaking wet and decided to take a break to dry his clothes. He thought about his magic and why fire and water spells were difficult to control, and his conclusion was that they were constantly moving, so it took time to get used to them. That's why Sho decided to test the freezing magic. It should be easier to control than fire and water magic. And if he succeeded, it would be very useful for him to fight against various monsters. Sho raised his hand and hoped that his magic would work. As soon as he was ready, he chanted his spell in an instant. Everything around him froze. The grass covered in ice and the air became much colder than a few seconds ago. After that, he was thrilled that he managed to get at least one spell right. But even that spell turned out to be much stronger than he thought. Still, it was much easier to handle and control, and he thought it was perfect for practice. He finally arrived at the southern forest that Roland had mentioned, and he decided to test some of his theories while looking for the full moon grass. The forest was dense, and as Roland had mentioned, it was really dark even though it was midday and the sun was shining brightly above. He remembered taking one of the mana stones from the old Podan man, and he wanted to try his tracking spell. If his theory was correct, he would be able to locate all the places filled with monsters, and in that way, he could avoid any fights altogether. He took a deep breath once again, and as he used his spell, small dots all over the forest started to glow and shimmer. His theory was indeed correct, and Sho now knew where all the monsters were. He thanked the god for giving him the book, and therefore she was responsible for his success. He happily returned the stone to his bag and thought that he didn't need to worry about monsters anymore. He started searching for moon grass during the full moon, but after a while he felt completely hopeless. He saw different pictures of different plants and they were all valuable. His attention kept getting distracted, and as he evaluated all those plans, he understood how precious they were and he couldn't just leave them behind. There were so many items that he picked some different mushrooms that seemed edible and he thought the villagers would be very happy if he brought them back to the village. Besides, there was a specific grass called Mai Mai that made funny noises when plucked, and its sound was so addictive that. Sho spent most of her time just picking it. Besides, our protagonist was never satisfied with the sensation of picking it, planting with bare hands because VR couldn't even compare through that feeling. Moreover, she was happy to experience all the fatigue and hunger from walking and picking plants. The sensation was truly different from seeing stamina and mana bars depleted in the game menu. His stomach growled again, and of course he realized that she had nothing to eat for a while now. There was a small open space not covered by trees, so he could see the sun directly above him, which made him realize that the sunlight was directly hitting the forest floor. And then Sho decided to sit down and have a picnic. He opened his magic bag and took out all the equipment that he needed, such as plates, some utensils, the mushrooms Shu had collected earlier, and the magical stove that he bought from the old man Podan at his variety shop.